Okay. Well, Paul Hohenlo last night or yesterday afternoon covered many of the themes that we're going to cover today. I, I thought of simply canceling the whole day and, and just saying, well, he covered it all, so uh, we'll, uh, we won't bother. But I thought a little um, mindless repetition wouldn't hurt. And um, I want to today talk first about Brownian motion of a single of genes and how that relates to a single quantitative character um, and how that character will be distributed on a tree. Paul gave a sort of abstract of that material. Then the second talk today will be about multivariate characters and some of the quest some of the uh, I other issues that he also raised about um, what are the explanations for divergence among lineages in a phylogeny in terms of neutral and non-neutral forces. Uh, between those two, we'll have had a Brownian motion lab, which uh, uh, Brian O'Meara and Marguerite Butler, it's, uh, Brian's the name on it on the schedule, but Marguerite is, is joining him to do a Brownian motion, a simulating Brownian motion R exercise in which you get to do that yourself. And uh, after the multivariate, um, covering multivariate characters uh, after lunch, I will talk about comparative methods on phylogenies, and we'll then have a comparative method exercise. And at the very end of the afternoon, Brian O'Meara will uh, come back on talking about um, um, Bayesian methods and maximum likelihood. Um, so let me start out on, on Brownian motion. And the, um, we want to uh, approximate the, the change of quantitative characters with the purpose of, of, of looking at the change that would occur on a phylogeny, uh, on the lineages in a phylogeny. And that can occur as a result of genetic drift of pre-existing alleles that are in the population. But another process that's occurring at the same time is mutation to new alleles. So there are new alleles arising that affect that quantitative character. There could be natural selection affecting the alleles at each locus for purposes maybe unrelated to the particular character you're looking at. And that could be variable selection. If it's all uniform selection, it may not show up in divergence among lines, among, among uh, lineages. But you also, of course, have selection on, the fit, uh, on fitness, which is based on the whole phenotype. And that's what Steve talked about yesterday and Paul uh, also mentioned, uh, and what Adam was, uh, was talking about in, the, in chasing uh, a multivariate set of characters chasing an adaptive peak. So all of these themes will, will show up in what I'm talking about. The, um, suppose you just take the process of genetic drift of a single allele at a locus. So you have two alleles at a locus. So you're following one of them. You have genetic drift. It, it would be the same if you had multiple alleles, but you're just following one of them. Um, and one of the things you can do if you want to know what that w uh, process looks like is to set up a standard population genetic model. The standard population genetic model is the so-called Wright-Fisher model, which was from uh, Sewell Wright in 1932 and R.A. Fisher in 1930. And it's a model that you've probably heard of, but the details of it are basically that the parents produce an infinite number of offspring with, ev with individuals contributing equally unless they have differential fertilities. And you get this pool of offspring with everything in its expected proportions. So it's a model something like um, a, um, it's something like an intertidal organism with planktonic larvae. They're casting billions of larvae up into the water. And in doing so, all possible matings are occurring in their expected frequency. So everything is deterministic. You get different gen genotype proportions in those, um, in those planktonic larvae. And then comes time for the planktonic larvae to settle out, and there's only capital N places that they can survive. And so a random sampling of those planktonic larvae succeed in becoming adults for the next generation. That's the right Fisher model. Other 
other schemes of reproduction are, are accommodated within that, that one's easy to, to analyze, and, and all the classic population genetic work is on it. And any variations from that life cycle are handled basically by uh, computing effective population sizes and saying, well, these other more complicated models will approximate a right Fisher model, but at a slightly different uh, population size than, than they seem to have. Um, so you can take the right Fisher model and you can compute the transition probability matrix. And for a simple segregation of two alleles in, a, uh, in the, the population it assumes, which has uh, it's monoecious, there's only one type, there's not two, two different sexes, and, and individuals by casting their eggs and sperm into the sea could mate with anybody including themselves uh, in, the, in the appropriate proportions. In that, in that idealized model, the gene frequency, if the gene frequency is P, so that the, it, with capital N individuals, so there are two N copies of the gene, 2n times p is the number of copies you have. So it's the, you take that number, let's call it i, and the number you'll get in the next generation will be, it, it turns out, will simply be a binomial sample of 2n copies at that gene frequency, the i over 2n. So the, the elements of this transition probability matrix are just binomial frequencies. At the starting gene frequency, there are all the different outcomes, all the different terms. Each row of the matrix, well, let's see, each, depends on how you, how you do it, but each, each, the set of elements that represent the different possible um, outcomes uh, add to one, and they're just the terms of a binomial distribution. Okay, you can make up that matrix for modest size capital N. Um, you could do it for up to maybe N around 1,000. Uh, depending on how much memory and time you have. And you can compute all the elements of that transition probability matrix. And then you can say, OK, we want to know where that gene frequency is going to go under simple genetic drift. Uh, and for that, all you have to do is power up the matrix. You just multiply it by itself, multiply it by another one of itself each generation. And you can do the same thing a little more efficiently computationally by getting eigenvalues and eigenvectors and computing the power that way. So you can, you can compute it numerically and figure out what the distribution of gene frequencies is after, say, a thousand generations. Um, uh, you can do that numerically. Now, it might be nicer if we had a formula that said, given a current gene frequency of 0.3, here is the distribution of gene frequencies we'd have after a thousand generations. Unfortunately, we can't do that. The, uh, t the technical uh, description here is we've got the eigenvalues of that matrix and one set of eigenvectors, the right eigenvectors, but the left eigenvectors, the inverse of that, has never been computed analytically. So we can't do that. But there's a good approximation called the diffusion approximation, which uh, goes back originally to R.A. Fisher and Sewell Wright, but developed most fully in the 1950s by Moto Kimura. And he was able to solve for the distribution. Now, what, what it does is to approximate the jumping around among gene frequencies by jiggling of a diffusion process. That's like Brownian motion, but the Ra the rate of change in different parts of the scale, the gene frequency scale, is a little bit different. So it isn't the Brownian motion. It's a cousin, it's a more complicated thing than Brownian motion. Kimura, nevertheless, in 1955, figured out the transition probabilities, but he had to do it by using uh, uh, Gegenbauer polynomials, which, if you ask me to write them down, I, I, I don't know them well enough to write them down. And yeah, you can compute it, but it's a lot of computational power. And after you finish doing that, you might say, uh, gee, why would, didn't we just approximate it by making up this matrix and powering it? It'll be a little easier to think about. The point is we don't have a simple formula for what the gene frequencies, where the gene frequencies will go. Uh, it's a lot of work to do numerically, and it can't be done analytically. OK. So we have to make use of simple approximations. And here. Uh, is a picture of two people who did a remarkable work in 1964. Uh, both uh, 
trained as population geneticists, both in association in one way or another with R.A. Fisher. Um, in the mid-60s, Anthony Edwards and Luca Cavalli-Sforza um, were in northern Italy in Pavia, where Luca had a professorship, and they were working on gene frequencies among different human populations, uh, and I believe it was in the Parma Valley. <coughs> Excuse me. And Luca had a, a data set of this, and, and they wanted to sort of investigate what genetic drift would do uh, in the Parma Valley. Now, people actually don't have a phylogeny because they, they do, in, uh, populations of people do not show a neat phylogeny because they do inconvenient things like moving from one town to another uh, and having gene flow. So, uh, but they nevertheless decided to, the first thing they tried to do was to make a branching tree of relationship among these human populations. So they're not different species, they're all in the same species, they're ignoring gene flow. And they, um, they then had to figure out how to model that. Now, it's a long story, but basically they tried to estimate these, um, the, these trees by several different methods. One, was, one became the first published parsimony method, for those who were, in, 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 who were up on inferring phylogenies, parsimony methods are, are one of the major categories of method. They published the first one, which was to make up a gene frequency space and try to tie the points together uh, with a tree, a branching tree of minimum total length in that space. They also had another method, which was a, the fir one of the first distance matrix methods, where you try to compute genetic distances among populations and make a tree that, that predicts those most accurately. And they began to argue with each other about this, saying, well, I think you should do it this way. No, I think we should do it that way. For our purposes, what's important is that what happened then. Uh, they were going to a meeting in uh, southern Italy, um, and Luca uh, flew to the meeting. It was in Naples, I think. Um, and Anthony took the train, and while they were, while Luca was flying and while Anthony was on the train, they both had the same thought. They said, thought, well, you know, if we asked R.A. Fisher, our great professor, who was it by then had died, he would say do it by maximum likelihood. So let's try to figure out what maximum likelihood phylogenies are, and then it'll be one of our two methods that'll tell us which one is right. So they got to Naples and they, they found that they had had the same thought. So they started developing maximum likelihood phylogenies, and their publication in 1964 on this is the first that I can find of maximum likelihood phylogeny paper. That paper introduced parsimony and it introduced maximum likelihood. It didn't mention their distance method. They also had that. So the, we now can, can roughly divide phylogeny methods into parsimony, distance methods, likelihood, and Bayesian methods. Two of those four they introduced, and the third they had but didn't. Uh, so it's a remarkable piece of work. In the process of modeling gene frequency change, they, they came up against this issue of needing to compute the probability of going from one gene frequency to another in a certain a branch of the tree of a certain length in a lineage. And what they said was, well, we don't know. You know we don't want to use the, all the Kimura machinery or do it numerically. We need a formula. Let's approximate the gene frequency change by Brownian motion. So they were really the first people that I can find that said, well, we'll approximate it by Brownian motion. Now, Brownian motion, you're moving along a scale, and at any given moment, there's a constant variance of the places that you will go to. And it's constant. It's the same everywhere on the scale. And the scale goes off to, to minus infinity and off to infinity. Well, the, brown, the gene frequency scales between 0 and 1. And the variance of gene frequencies under genetic drift, under the right Fisher process, is simply the binomial variance at the current gene frequency. So if the current gene frequency is, point, is 0.3, and the population size of 
technically for right fisher, it's not effective population size. Let me fit it to any other model you use, the effective size. If n were 1,000, this will be 0 0.3 times 0 0.7 over 2,000. That's the current, that's the variance in one generation. And if they approximate it by Brownian motion, they just say, well, we'll take the current gene frequency and just assume that that variance continues to apply, which isn't quite true. Because as you get to the end of the scale, as you get to p getting near 0 or 1, this dies away. This is a parabola with its peak around 50%. So what are they doing approximating it as a constant? Well, I wanted to show you some numerical, um, uh, some numerical calculations. Okay, so this is done with R. And basically what it is, is start saying, suppose we start at gene frequency 0.5, and we have a population of size 50. And this, I've, um, this, is exact, this is not simulation. This is exact calculation using the transition probabilities of the Wright-Fisher model. So it's a 100 by 100 matrix. It's actually a 101 by 101 matrix, because the possible gene frequencies go from no copies up to 100 copies. That's 101 different values. So there's 101 by 101 transition probability matrix. Well, if you take the 10th power of that matrix, you go forward 10 generations. Then from a starting gene frequency of 0.5, where the, the number, the fraction of times that you are predicted to end up in these frequencies is given by these vertical black bars. And if you look at them, you'll see, yeah, it looks pretty normal. But let's compare it to a normal. Let's take a normal distribution starting at 0.5 with the variance equal to the, uh, the, the, the gene frequency variance at that gene frequency and simply go forward 10 generations. Now what you'll do is you'll, you're basically taking a normally distributed, well, Brownian motion technically goes in continuous time, but the amount of variance it piles up in one generation is this p times 1 minus this 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 over 2n. And if you just multiply that, if you say we get the same variance every generation, you can easily show <coughs> that where you expect to be is distributed in the nor a bigger normal distribution with variance 10 times the initial variance. Now, if I take that and divide it up it's a continuous distribution. It sticks out past 0 and out past 1. If I take each little gene frequency range and just consider the amount of mass that's in that one, so for the end one, it's everything. I take the point in between these two gene frequencies, and you go from there down to minus infinity. So you get a little, you say, take everybody in that tail and put them there. Same thing at the other end. It's, in this case, symmetrical. And the other ones, you just take a little slice, the appropriate little slice of points that are closest to that gene frequency. You get, and you get the purple circles. And you can look at it and say, oh, that's pretty good. It's not perfect. It's got a little too much stuff in the middle. Uh, it's got a little too much stuff at the two ends. But in between, it's sort of good. It's like a little low here and a little high there. Uh, but if somebody said, well, we could approximate by that, you'd probably say, I'm willing. But that's for a starting gene frequency of 0.5. Now I want to um, show you gene frequency computer simulated before we go on to other cases. Let me see if I can get the computer to cooperate. I have a computer program that I use for teaching. Yeah, there we go. Which comes from my, it, it was written in our laboratory. Uh, it was written uh, many years ago, back in the 70s originally, uh, know, in Fortran uh, and used as a class teaching exercise. And it simply simulates genetic drift, natural selection with two alleles at a single locus uh, in a finite size population, um, natural simple forms of natural selection, mutation back, back and forth between the two alleles, and migration among a set of populations that are doing this. Now, we won't use any of those other forces. We'll just consider um, the random mating and genetic drift. It since became uh, a thing you could run on personal computers. And in the last year, it got rewritten into Java. So now it will run on 
You just have to have Java installed on your machine. It'll run, it'll run on anything. It's called POPG. Uh, um, and if you want to get it yourself, uh, it's used in um, various classes uh, worldwide. Uh, just as a, as a simple free uh, genetic drift simulation, genetic drift and population genetics simulation programs. If you, if you want it, you can probably just type that into a browser. You'll get to our site and you can download it. I'm not, we're not doing a lab on it here. Uh, so what we do is this run menu. We want a new run. And uh, it's supposed to come up. There we go. And it gives you a box that uh, you can type things into. So let's take a population of size 1,000. I think it lets you go up to 100,000. Uh, you can run quite large, quite large cases on it. We're going to keep the fitnesses equal. We'll have no mutation. We'll have no, no migration. We'll start with a gene frequency of 50%. We'll go forward. Here it says well, there'll be 10 populations. You can go up to, uh, I think, about 1,000 populations. Uh, and we're going to run 1,000 generations. So we're running 1,000 generations with a population size of 1,000. And uh, if I say then say, OK, there it goes. So that's 10 populations undergoing genetic drift. So you can see that there's a spread among the 10. Now, these are not influencing each other, so they're just, there's no migration. So there's just, uh, they're just replicates. The blue line across there is what an infinitely large population will do. It's just a deterministic calculation. For genetic drift, the, the expectation is no change. Uh, there's no natural selection or other force to change anything, so it just goes straight across. Um, so what you can see is two populations have drifted down to the loss of the allele. It happens here that nobody has drifted to fixation. Um, there's jiggling of these gene frequencies. Now, this isn't, Brown, isn't Brownian motion. It's cousin of Brownian motion. It's the more urban, sophisticated cousin of Brownian motion because it does things like jiggle less as you get down towards zero or less as you get up to one. That's kind of hard to see here. So the distribution in which these things are to be distributed looks like the one we just saw. The one we just saw was 100 individuals for 10 generations. There are, by the way, scaling rules that for the diffusion approximation that hold pretty well for, for these Wright-Fisher models. And they say that a population of size 1,000, that a population of size 100 will do in 10 generations just about the same thing that a population of size 1,000 will do in 100 generations. So that distribution I, s I showed you is, th this is a sample of 10 points from essentially the distribution I just showed you. Um, so there's, there's genetic drift. If you go on, um, I just wanted to, to have some visualization of the process. You can continue and continue and continue. And what you've seen is populations are wandering up here and getting fixed. There are now three of them fixed. Four of them have lost. There's, there's another one losing. Three are still left segregating. And if we keep going, of course, they, they end up. Um, see there. Now all but one is still drifting. By the way, um, in this simulation, it, it's not important, but you'll see when the lines cross, and you might want to know, uh, when this comes in here and then it crisscrosses, is it the one that's down here, or is it the one that's up there? The short answer is 50-50. I mean, we don't know. Uh, you can show that, it, that when, the, when the two of these lines cross, uh, they're equally likely to that, that it's, it's equally probable that right after that, that um, the first one is the higher one, or the second one is the higher one. That's, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no momentum in this process. So when two lines happen to cross, they're, they're, the, the interesting thing is a Markov process. And being a Markov process, it has no momentum. And having no momentum, it doesn't continue down. There's no sense in which it does. Yes? 
please. And let's find our microphone so I can harass people to use them. And let's, when we're handing out microphones, let's have the person handing them out switch them on before they get them to the person. Okay, please. Uh, can you repeat what you said about the scaling relationship? Like from, was it 10 generations of population size 100 is the same as uh, population size of 1,000 for 100 generations? Yeah. Okay. That, that, that is true exactly in the diffusion process, in the diffusion approximation. But the diffusion approximations, which I don't have time to go into here, are very, very accurate approximations. They're amazingly accurate. And so for a right Fisher process, it's almost true. It, and for, for, the pr for practical purposes, it's true, not exactly true. And th that, those kind of diffusion scaling rules are, by the way, very broad. They cover lots of things. And they basically say that any two cases will behave the same if, the, if they have the amounts of time proportional to the population size and if the, determ the forces of selection, mutation, and migration, if their terms n times the mutation rate, n times the selection coefficient, or n times the migration rate are the same in the two cases. So that's very useful because what it means is you can, you can simulate the behavior of a population of 10 million by doing a population of 1,000 in your computer if you get all the scaling rules right. This is something most students don't know, um, and I, I wish it were more widely known. Um, so we have our genetic drift here. We're simulating it. Um, and finally, everybody goes fixed. It happens uh, that five fix up and five fix down. Of course, it's random. It's like coin tosses, so it'll fluctuate. Won't always be exactly that. And you can make larger numbers of lineages uh, by doing 100 lineages. So here we're simulating 100. And you can see they're spreading out in this not quite normal distribution. Starting to get fixed, we now have 15 of them fixed. And as we go on, they're spreading out widely, but quite a few piling up fixed and lost. Now we have, uh, we have uh, 43 of the 100 are now fixed or lost. And finally, the center is getting thinner and the ends are getting one, one problem in this computer display, all computer displays, is that two black lines written on top of each other aren't any blacker. Uh, that's true in computers. It's not true when you draw on a piece of paper. Um, and so here, mostly everybody here, now we have 39 fixed and 39 lost. I didn't, uh, that's rather, and finally we're getting to where only a few lines are fixed or lost are not fixed or lost. Here we go. Three lines still not fixed or lost. It could take a long time. The computer speeds up because uh, it knows when not to waste its time drawing random numbers. There's only one left, and we have to wait until that gets around to fixing. It's not getting there. <laughs> uh, there it goes. So we have 49 fixed and 51 lost. The probability of fixation is equal to the um, is equal to the initial gene frequency. Why? Because a single copy from the initial population ends up randomly chosen ends up taking over in genetic drift, and and that which of course relates this to the coalescent, um, and so. Whatever the initial frequency is, that's the probability that that allele will be in, will be that single copy. Okay, so I just wanted to show you genetic drift accurately simulated by the POPG program, um, and we go back to the projection if we can find it. There we go, and we will do full screen if we can find it. Come on. Okay, so now let's go on to more of these uh, genetic drift simulations. You might say, well, after 20 generations, starting with a gene frequency of 50%, what happens? And the answer is, there's a, this, is a, this 
note this point here and the comparable point over there. More pile up than you ex you less pile up, sorry, less are piling up than the the uh, Brownian motion approximation expects. Why is that? Because the variance actually in the right Fisher process gets less as you go out here, but the Brownian motion process assumes that it stays the same, and so assumes that more stuff reaches the um, the last class than than happens in uh, in the bright Fisher process. So after 20 generations, here it is after 50 generations, and it's sort of approximated, kind of okay. Uh, now, if we go to cases in which you start at a, not at a 50% gene frequency, but 30%, you can see that, well, the approximation is not quite as good, but sort of okay after 10 generations. After 20 generations, eh, uh, might be give a sophisticated summary of this by saying, eh. And uh, here it is after 50 generations. If we start at 10% gene fre initial <coughs> gene frequency, it's kind of uh, and then hmm, and so on. Uh, let's see. I don't, for some reason, I didn't do 50, but you can see that uh, it's going to have more, you know, stuff will be piling up here and stuff will start piling up there, and there'll be some kind of not very good approximation in the middle. So that's to give you a feel of how the Brownian motion process does approximate gene frequency change. Not perfectly at all. OK, there's a hand up requesting a microphone. Yes. So the, the bars were from your simulations? No. No. The bars are from powering up a transition probability Got matrix it. numerically. Their only error is rounding error down in the eighth decimal place. Got it. OK. So, so they're very accurate. At least it's an idealized model. That's not what happens out in nature. But given that model, it's an accurate description of what that model will do. OK. Well, you might think, well, some people may have heard about the arc sine square root transformation. I'm going to skip over this because we're running late. Um, you can make such an approximation. People will tell you that that homogenizes variances in binomials. Some people may have heard of that. Uh, if you haven't, it, it isn't important to us. If you do that. What you find is, doing some Taylor series stuff, that um, the variance of this transformed new variable, the arc sine of the square root of the gene frequency, does homogenize. It becomes 1 over 8n. And uh, oh, that's good. We've got the variances now. We're on a scale where we've got the variances of genetic drift all the same. But fatal flaw. If you then ask not about the variances, but about the expected change. Now, under Brownian motion and under Wright-Fisher process, the average change is 0. If you draw from a binomial distribution, which is what happens in one step in the Wright-Fisher model, on average, you get the same gene frequency. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. The expected change is 0. On this new scale, it's a nonlinear transformation of the old scale. You can go through the whole um, Taylor series stuff. And what you find out is that the expected change is approximately this 1 over 8n times that formula. And when you look at that formula, that's your starting gene frequency, p0. That formula has the property that there's pressure away from the starting gene frequency. So if you do this arc sine square root thing, you homogenize the variances, but the means do weird things. Uh, so it doesn't get used in this literature. Um, we, we just are stuck with the ordinary Brownian motion approximation. OK. So that's to give you an idea what an allele frequency is doing under Brownian motion. What's that mean for a quantitative character? Um, well, if a quantitative character is a sum of contributions from a number of loci, and each of those loci is undergoing um, genetic drift, which we're approximating not imperfectly by Brownian motion. If you had no dominance, if the heterozygote at every locus is exactly in between the two, exactly halfway between the two homozygotes, then the linear combination, the, the phenotype is just a, a 
linear combination of the gene frequencies at each locus. So under genetic drift, um, the whole character will be a linear combination of Brownian motions, and you can easily show that that too will be a form of Brownian motion. It will undergo Brownian motion. So if Brownian motion accurately approximate in individual gene frequencies, and they're independently occurring at each locus, which is pretty much true, then you get a, a good approximation of, of, of a combination of, of a sum of contributions from different loci by itself by Brownian motion. That's the good news. The bad news is if there's any dominance, then it's a little bit nonlinear. At the contribution at each locus is a little bit of a, non, a quadratic function of gene frequency. And so it won't quite be uh, perfect. If you have epistasis, interaction among loci, that will cause more trouble. And you might say, write down a general expression for that. I can write you down a general expression for it. It'll have so many parameters in it, you'll practically go blind looking at it. And we don't know the values of any of those parameters, so it, it, won't, it won't really be helpful to do that. Um, I think I am the first person to take uh, Cavalli's forts uh, and Edwards's Brownian motion approximation to gene frequencies and discuss this issue of uh, using that to approximate the change of quantitative characters. That's in my uh, 73 paper in American Journal of Human Genetics, which was on um, um, phylogenies with, uh, with gene frequencies or with, and I mentioned, I discussed quantitative characters some. But that picture that I painted is still an oversimplification because we're, we've got mutation. We don't have just two alleles at each locus. If you had multiple alleles, I, in the previous slide I mentioned multiple alleles is OK. Um, but you also have new alleles arising by mutation. This is just a cartoon. Um, and so in addition to the processes of genetic drift, you have popping up of new alleles, which themselves have patterns of dominance with existing alleles. Uh, and if there's, if there's gene interaction, if there's epistasis, they bring in more epistatic effects. So when you start thinking about that, it's rather hard without defining some model for all of that. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's hard to know what it will do. So at that point, we're just waving our hands and saying, well, I think, I think Brownian motion will be kind of, sort of, OK. So I didn't want to leave you with the impression that um, Brownian motion is always a pretty good approximation. We don't know that. We know we're, we're waving our hands rather furiously. In particular, if you're on a scale and you're approaching, at Brownian motion will always have a chance of moving to the left or moving to the right. On average, it will be unbiased. Um, and no matter where you are in the scale, it can, also, it can always continue moving to the left and moving to the right. And but many characters will have the property that there is some kind of developmental limit. The, the you know, one feature of the organism approaches another, but if that form is to be maintained, doesn't go past it. Uh, for example, uh, the length of a bone can go down to zero, but it can't go negative. Okay. Uh, the angle between some uh, structures could get to down to zero, and the things could get squashed together, but they can't go past each other. There are many, develop there are many processes, many developmental processes that, that will have limits of one sort or another for uh, the change of some of the measurable characters. So if you're on a scale where you're near the limit, suppose this, this is the limit here, a Brownian motion approximation would say that you leap right past it, and that's not realistic. What you have to assume is that as you get out near the limit, there are more mutations away than there are mutations towards it. Or, and or, the mutations towards it don't go as far because they're running into the limit. You might, uh, you can have things like, well, very sophisticated structures, in which case most mutation will tend to degrade them. So there, there are uh, limit limits and difficulties in these processes in real life that are not reflected in the Brownian motion process. Um, and, and we have to think about that and not get too intoxicated by the Brownian motion. Okay. 
variable selection I mentioned could be another reason for processes that look like Brownian motion. Their variances are very heterogeneous, too. The, the genetic drift has this parabola. They have a kind of squared parabola. But there's a lot of possible different variable selection processes that you could imagine where selection coefficients at a locus are changing themselves according to some wandering process. Um, and there's just many, many different such processes you could imagine unless you have some biology to tell you. So again, we're waving our hands rather furiously. And in addition, we have selection that may be on the whole value of the whole character. And that, of course, is this picture of selective peaks of adaptive landscapes. By the way, uh, Steve used AL, adaptive landscape. But let's remember, the same thing is also called adaptive topography, uh, fitness surface, adaptive surface, fitness. You know, take the words fitness and adaptive and the words topography, landscape, and, and uh, surface. And you put them together in any combination. Uh, so when you see any of those, you're, you're actually talking about one of the two kinds of uh, uh, surfaces, that uh, landscapes, that Steve was talking about. Um, in Brownian motion, it's the, it, the great advantage of it for all of these disadvantages is that it's tractable. The amount of change in a, in a length of time t <coughs> is simply the um, expected to be drawn from a normal distribution, which is at your original value, has a variance, who then, which then gets multiplied by the length of time t. When we're doing branch lengths on a phylogeny, those are pseudo times, and you get the same behavior. So the transition probability to go from value x now to value y, t generations from now, is just drawn from a normal, it's just a normally a Gaussian density uh, with a variance that you can calculate. Uh, and that means that transition probabilities allow us to do the calculations we need to do likelihood or Bayesian inference uh, on phylogenies. What I want to not so much em emphasize that, but uh, the Brownian motion for time t has expectation 0 and va some variance sigma squared times t. We already saw that. Uh, Paul was talking about that. And if you have successive time intervals, it's a random change starting it for t time. And then the change in the next period of time is independent of that. And so you have a sum of independent pieces which have variances sigma squared t1, sigma squared t2, sigma squared t3. The variance of a sum of random variables that are independent is just the sum of the variances. So you get sigma squared times the total branch length, or in some cases, length, uh, amount of time. What I'm going to do, I'm trying to do this really quickly so we can get to the exercise, because I think I was supposed to end at 9.45 and I'm running over. Um, but this is important. Um, and this is a point that, again, Paul, Paul gave a version of this last night. Um, if you have an, a, a phylogeny, and we're now entering, with Paul's talk, we are entering phylogeny world. Uh, and to some extent, bringing with us the baggage from, within, from single generation change in a, in a single population. If you start at a value x0, position x0 on the scale, uh, and then you go to x1, and then there's a descendant branch that goes to x2 and another descendant branch that goes to x3, we can compute the probability of this change. And it's a normal, this is, x1 is drawn from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance proportional to the branch, to the time. Uh, if you measure in, in variance units, then you could consider a branch length equal to that variance. That's, this is a, an important point which, um, which we will use. So the change from x1, the, the difference the displacement from x to x1 from x0 
And the displacement from x2 to x2 from x1, and th this displacement, those deltas, which are here, are all independent. They're all drawn from normal distributions. They have variances that are the v's for the particular branches. And they're all independent. So if you ask yourself, in the end, what's the distribution of these two that you observe up at the tips? Those are the ones you, in most cases, those are the ones we observe. If you look at them and say, well, what's their joint distribution? The distribution of x2 given x0 is normal with a variance v1 plus v2 and a mean 0. Uh, mean equal to x0, I'm sorry, the change, mean of the change is 0. So this is normally distributed, this is normally distributed. Together, they are bivariate normally distributed. And the bivariate normal distribution has variances and covariances. It's characterized by uh, its means, and the means of these, the expectations of these are all x0, the starting point. Their variances are v1 plus v2, v1 plus v3. But what's the covariance? And the covariance is the covariance of this sum with this sum. And if you do that down here, you'll say, well, x0 is a constant. And it's not, uh, it's not varying. It's our starting point. When we do covariances between these, you'll, the, only co the only terms that will come in are the deltas. And so here they are down here. The covariance of delta x1 plus delta x2 with the total change up the other branch, delta x1 plus delta x3, you work out all the terms. And, it, and by the independence of the deltas in different branches, that 0, that 0, that 0, all that's left is this one, the covariance of delta x1 with itself. Now, it is a general rule for covariances, which I don't have time to prove, but can be proven in just a couple lines of algebra that the covariance of a variable with itself is just its variance. And the variance here of delta x1 is just v1. So the, the covariance between these two tips is the variance accumulated up their common ancestor, up the line as far as their common ancestor. Moving from there, we can consider a whole tree. And here's a tree with seven tips. And you see all the displacements, and you see the v parameters, which are the, the, the expected variance in each branch, which we're taking to be a branch length. And you can think of as if, if the variances are per unit time are all equal, those are also proportional to elapsed time. Looking at that, you can say, well, can we compute the joint distribution of all these tips? And the answer is yes. Up any one line, it's just a sum of normal pieces. So the, the, the x4 is drawn from a normal distribution. So are all the others. They, they form a seven variable normal distribution. They have variances, which are just the sums up the branches. And they have covariances. So the covariance of x5 and x7, for example, will be the variance accumulated up as far as their common ancestor. That's, um, in this case, v11 plus v12. And you can make a table like that. So you have, I'm sorry, you have a seven variable normal distribution with expectations equal to the starting point. They, they all have the same expectation. And covariance matrix, here's the covariance matrix. And you can just read the elements right off the tree, which is what we've done here. Uh, so there was, let's see, number x5 with x7, that's this one. Uh, or it's this one. And they're both v11 plus v12, the, var the variance accumulated in, on the, in the common ancestor. It's a patterned matrix, and the pattern is exactly dictated by the tree. The, the values within values within values here are the nested structure of the tree. Um, here is a simulation. You'll be doing simulations in a moment of two lineages that have just split. 
If you talk to a mathematician about Brownian motion, they get very excited. There's a the mathemat the mathematical construct called Brownian motion has lots of wonderful exotic properties. What they love to talk about is this period down here when the two lines crisscross each other a great many times for a certain length of time. And there's all kinds of exotic mathematical results about that. And none of them matters for us. Okay. <laughs> all that matters is this is a net normal change, and so is that, and they're independent. Um, and here they go. This one split again. There's two lineages here. They're doing a lot of crisscrossing. This one. And finally, this thing splits. And you see, things, it's very noisy. You can't just look at them and read off the structure of the tree. You'll need many of these characters in order to infer a tree if you're doing phylogenetic inference. But there is a, a set of five characters, five, sorry, five populations, five species undergoing Brownian motion. Yes? This sort of x-axis, is this um, a single Pardon. locus, or is this a, a, a quantitative character? That yes. You're? OK. The answer to that is yes. Both. Right. Uh, what was the first thing you said? Is it a? Is it a single locus or a, a quantitative character? Yes, that it you is. Right. Got it. <laughs> yes, to both. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. But a single locus is a quantitative character. It's a one gene quantitative character with no environmental variance and with uh, the heterozygote right in between the two homozygotes. It's the count of how many big A or little a alleles you have. But that's a quantitative character too. Okay. So. I have a, a, a bunch of material here, and I think I've run out of time. Um, and I think what I will do is continue it in the second lecture this morning. That means I may have overdone it. I may have too much material, and I'll do a certain amount of it can be shown that instead of going through the, the steps on this. Uh, but where we are headed is to use all this to show a convenient way of computing likelihoods on a phylogeny, which happens also to show us that certain differences, certain contrasts on the phylogeny are independent of each other and can be scaled so they have equal variances. And that will turn out to be an essential thing that we do when we talk about comparative methods in the early afternoon. Um, I will come back to it. Um, just to give you a preview, here are, by the way, some of the literature. Let's see, here we go. Uh, William Feller's great diffusion equation diffu paper on formal mathematical, uh, a, a better mathematical treatment, a more rigorous mathematical treatment of diffusion processes. Here's Kimura's papers, solving with Gegenbauer polynomials. Uh, Edwards and Cavalli's Fortz's papers, a later, more formal, uh, more mathematical uh, review by Edwards in 1970, my 1973 paper, um, some nice stuff by Rasmus Nielsen, uh, Joanna Mountain, John Hulsenbeck, and Monty Slacken in 1998. Um, Elizabeth Thompson, my, who is now the chair of our statistics department in Seattle, um, but w at, when she was a student at Cambridge University, wrote a Smith's Prize winning PhD thesis called Human Evolutionary Trees with um, a lot of beautiful machinery for uh, the, the Brownian motion approximation. Here's a redo of my 1973 paper in, Amer um, this says American Journal of Human Genetics. You know what? I'm wrong. That's evolution. That should say evolution. It was republished in evolution. Uh, and then um, some stuff on uh, using, using powering up uh, Transition probability matrices to show how gene free, to show how um, basically how genetic distances behave. And, and there's some material in my book in chapter 23. So we haven't finished the last part of this, um, of this talk, but we'll pick up on that uh, later on.